Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine here in the hearts of Westminster. Well, there were three and a half hours of questions for Boris Johnson from MPs on the Privileges Committee today, all to find out, did the former Prime Minister knowingly mislead the House over lockdown parties in Downing Street? He was emphatic, verging on angry in his denials to what some of his supporters call a kangaroo court. But there were difficult questions and some awkward exchanges. We'll have to wait for a verdict that could, just could, lead to his removal from Parliament. Well, on an extremely busy political day, Rishi Sunak overwhelmingly won a key vote on his new deal with the EU in Northern Ireland, oh, when he finally published his tax returns. A good day to do that, perhaps. Plenty to get stuck into as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give for this committee should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Well, Boris Johnson said he tru truly believed what he was saying was correct and he followed the rules to the best of his ability. People who say that we were partying in lockdown simply do not know what they are talking about. Plenty of his answers left some on the committee less than impressed and there will now be a very nervous wait for its report. Meanwhile... The eyes to the right, 515. The nose to the left... 29. 22 of his own party voted against the key Stormont break. That's part of the PM's deal with the EU in Northern Ireland. But it sailed through the Commons with Labour support. And then we had this. The Prime Minister's tax affairs for the last three years were published. And it told us what we already knew. He is a very rich man and he has paid hundreds of thousands of pounds of tax on millions of pounds of capital gains. So we've got some great guests on the show today, including the chair of the Conservative Party, Greg Hands, on what must be a very busy day for him. For Labour, we'll be joined by the party's Shadow Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, that's Jim McMahon. And we're going to be talking to Jim Shannon for the DUP and much more just but decides all coming up on The Take. Well, it's been quite the day here in Westminster. A former Prime Minister grilled by MPs for hours, a current PM publishing his long-awaited tax return, a vote on the Windsor framework that would dominate the news on any normal day, and we haven't even mentioned PMQs. So let's crack straight on, shall we? We can start with the popcorn moment earlier when Boris Johnson was up in front of the Privileges Committee. I'm here to say to you, hand on heart, that I did not lie to the House, but it never occurred to me or I think the current Prime Minister at the time, that the event was not in compliance with the rules. At the press conferences over this period, you regularly repeated the phrase, hands, face, space. So there can be no doubt that you understood what the guidance and rules meant and were intended to, to, to achieve, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. The question is uh, whether what you said about this particular way of thanking your staff in the House of Commons was strictly accurate. The guidance does not say uh, you can have a thank you party. I, I believed that this event was uh, not only reasonably necessary, but it was essential for work purposes. But another witness stated, stated that they couldn't get through the room to leave because people were standing four to five people deep. Uh, is there any reason why we should disbelieve that? People who say that we were partying in lockdown simply do not know what they are talking about. So why did you tell the House all guidance was followed completely in Number 10? Nobody came to me and said, uh, we've got a problem with this one. Uh, Did any government law officer or any member of the government legal department, did anyone of those give you the assurance? The, the short answer is no, they didn't. We would be entitled to be a bit dismayed about the flimsy no. nature of this assurance no. when we took it at face value that these assurances amounted to something, and it looks from what you've told us in answer to Mr Coss's questions, that they did not amount to much at all. Extraordinary uh, to witness uh, that today. Now, a little earlier, as Boris Johnson was giving the evidence that we just saw, I spoke to the chair of the Conservative Party, Greg Hands. So we're doing this interview at 4.30. 
At 2 p.m. today, Boris Johnson started his evidence to the Privileges Committee about whether he misled Parliament. At 2.30, MPs vote on Rishi Sunak's Brexit deal, and we're imminently expecting to see the Prime Minister publish his tax returns. Now, you had control over the timing of two out of three of these things. So why are they all happening on the same day? Well, uh, it's, it's a busy day in politics, Sophie. There's been a lot of busy days in politics uh, the last few years. Um, obviously, the Privileges Committee is working to the timetable of the Privileges Committee. Uh, Rishi Sunak's got a, a commitment to publish his tax returns, as has Keir Starmer, uh, I might add as well. I think it's pure coincidence they're happening on the same day. Pure coincidence? Come on, you're taking us to fools there. You know, Rishi Sunak promised to publish his tax returns on the 16th of November. He's just coincidentally happened to do it on the day that Boris Johnson's appearing in front of the Privileges Committee. We're supposed to believe that. Well, uh, I think the, the, you're right. The, the Prime Minister has pledged to publish his tax returns. Keir Starmer has also pledged to pa publish his tax I'm returns. I'm talking about the timing. The, the timing, I believe, is a coincidence. I don't think there's anything else out there. Uh, I think in terms of the Privileges Committee, that's down to the Privileges Committee, in terms of the legislation, we would always be clear, have been clear, that we would publish um, the, uh, the Windsor framework uh, as negotiated back at Windsor with Ursula von der Leyen about three or four weeks ago, and it would be published in due course. That is the good timing to do this. People have had plenty of time to study um, the document, uh, both within the Conservative Party, DUP and elsewhere, uh, and it's not unusual that that vote should be held today on a Wednesday. You know, there's a reason that I'm starting with the timing, because I do think this is quite important. It, it makes it harder for people like me to do our jobs properly, to scrutinise things properly, when you're trying to cram so much, not just in a day, in a matter of four hours. Well, I, I think the House of Commons has coped well. The turnout has been high in those votes. Uh, it's the same day as Prime Minister's Question Time. I don't think it has put a, a burden on the House of Commons and a burden on people here uh, being able to do that scrutiny. The uh, Windsor framework has been published uh, some time ago, allowing people to look at that. And Boris Johnson's appearance at the Privileges Committee is obviously something which is, if you like, part of that uh, process which is down to Parliament. We haven't seen the uh, tax return yet from Rishi Sunak. We were waiting it. It was expected to come at 4pm. What we know is that it will show that the Prime Minister is extremely wealthy. Does that mean that he's out of touch? No, I don't think so at all, actually. Uh, I don't think so. It means that actually Rishi comes from a relatively modest background. His parents ran a pharmacy in Southampton. You know, he's somebody who, yes, he is wealthy uh, now, but does not come from that sort of a background. He really? comes from a background of immigration into this country, uh, parents who ran a pharmacy. One of his parents was a GP. You know, it's, a, it's a, a, not a poor background, but not an unusual background. Do you think most people who come from relatively modest backgrounds go to Winchester School then? Is that normal? Well, I think actually his parents uh, saved up a lot of money and worked really hard to get their child into a very, very good school. I think it's actually something to admire in his parents. When people look at the tax return, some people may think, look, this is a guy who has a lot of of wealth. How can he understand the issues that the country is now going through? How can he understand what parents are going through, for example, who send their, send their kids to the local state school and they feel that they don't have enough money uh, to properly give their kid the uh, education that well, they deserve? Or they just, he doesn't understand the energy bill crisis that so many people are struggling with. Well, I disagree with that. Look, I don't think there's a correlation between someone's personal wealth uh, and where they are in terms of understanding the public. The most important thing is that Rishi Sunak has shown by his delivery so far this year and his priorities that he has got the public's priorities by halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, uh, reducing hospital waiting lists and also stopping the boats are the people's priorities and that's what he should be judged on, the delivery of those priorities and delivery for the people of the United Kingdom. OK, well, we'll find out more, of course, when the tax returns uh, are uh, published. Um, but just to talk about Brexit, if I may, uh, the Windsor framework, the Brexit deal for Northern Ireland, passed relatively easy. Uh, there were rebellions from the Conservative side. It was a three-line whip, I think. So will there be repercussions for people who rebelled? Well, that, that'll be a matter um, for the Whip's office rather than a matter <clears throat> for me as chairman of the Conservative Party. Um, the most important thing here is that we got the deal through. 
Um, and with a uh, resounding, uh, really solid vote amongst uh, Conservative MPs, the vast majority of Conservative MPs supported it. And it's something that people said wasn't possible, that it wasn't possible to get a good deal with Brussels that works for the people of Northern Ireland, that works for the people of the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, unionist voters in Northern Ireland, three to one in favour of doing this deal. And Rishi Sunak has shown that he can deliver on the people's priorities, which includes coming to a good deal, which keeps Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom, respects the openness of the Irish border, and actually leads to an improving working relationship with Brussels as well. It's all about Northern Ireland, of course, this deal, and yet the eight unionist MPs, the DUP MPs, didn't vote for it. Does that matter? Well, uh, <clears throat> it's ultimately important that the deal went through. As I said, I think the people of Northern Ireland overall strongly support the deal. Uh, unionist voters support the deal at a ratio of three to one. What, what's your sort of evidence for that? Uh, I think it was an opinion poll overnight, uh, which the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland uh, referenced uh, today, and I think it's been referenced elsewhere. OK. Um, a couple of big beasts, <clears throat> of course, rebelled on it, including two former Prime Ministers, Liz Truss and also Boris Johnson. Were you disappointed to see them not following you through the same voting lobby? Well, I'm always disappointed when people aren't uh, supporting the government. Um, but nonetheless, I think it was a real achievement to get that through. Uh, with the vast majority of why, why, why do you think Liz Truss and Boris Johnson didn't back it? Do you think it's because they didn't think it was a good deal or because they actually just don't really like Richie Sunak very much? I, I think it's a question better put to them. What I'm clear about is two things. That it was a good deal, a good deal for the people of the UK, a good deal for the people of Northern Ireland, and a good deal for Conservative MPs as well, who are also looking to move on uh, past Brexit and to look forward to a more normal relationship, a more normal relationship also in terms of our trade across the Irish Sea, make sure that trade flows better. Do you have confidence in the Privileges Committee? Well, look, it's, a, it's Parliament has voted uh, to give the Privileges Committee that investigation. Uh, it, that is a matter for Parliament. The Parliament has that's got not my, That's not my question. Do you have confidence in the Privileges Committee? Well, it, again, I do think that is a matter for Parliament. If you're asking for me personally or the Conservative Party, we don't take a position on that. That is a matter for Parliament and it's a matter for MPs who've asked the Privileges Committee to set up this inquiry. OK. You're an MP. Do you have confidence in the Privileges Committee? It's not a trick question. It's, it's quite a simple question, right? Well, uh, the, the, but the way... I've been an MP for 18 years. Uh, nobody ever asked, do you have confidence in this committee or that committee? The committees get appointed by Parliament, in case, some cases, I think, elected by Parliament, and it's properly a matter for Parliament. It's not a matter for my individual opinion as an MP. I have confidence in Parliament structures overall. OK. So if the Privileges Committee find that an MP misled Parliament deliberately and, as a result, was in contempt of the House, should they be able to continue as an MP or do you think they should be suspended? Well, I, I think that, uh, again, is, is we'll have to see what the Privileges Committee does in this case. Uh, we have been clear, the Prime Minister has been clear, it will be a free vote uh, for Conservative MPs. We'll have to see what the Privileges Committee recommends, that that is the purpose of their investigation. Will you follow the recommendations of the Privileges Committee? Well, uh, I think it'll be a free vote for MPs. We'll have to see what the uh, the investigation uh, throws up and what the recommendation is. I wouldn't want to prejudge anything until then. OK. Is Boris Johnson a liar? Uh, look, I think that is uh, one of the questions that I think the Privileges Committee is looking at. You know, whether he... I think he's now said that he feels he did mislead Parliament. So the question is whether he willfully uh, misled Parliament. That is, if you like, the question in front of the Privileges Committee. I'll wait and see that investigation. Do you have an opinion on it, though? Do you think he did willfully mislead or lie, as other people might put it? I think the purpose of the Privileges Committee is to look at all of that evidence. I would want to see, if I were uh, 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 following it uh, closely, which I am, I would like to see what evidence he's given to the Privileges Committee, uh, what evidence have other people given, uh, what have uh, a senior civil servant said, what have special advisers said. I'd want to see all of the evidence. I mean, you say you've been following it closely, so what do you think so far? Well, uh, I, uh, his own, only his, um, in terms of his own uh, uh, evidence, I'd like to see other evidence as well. 
and I'm sure everybody will want to see other evidence and look closely at what's been said. So you haven't made up your mind then? I mean, that feels quite significant in a way. I mean, he's the guy who you know, was Prime Minister for the Conservative well, Party I, I think, recently. Uh, but I think that's the purpose of the investigation, is to get to the bottom, the, the committee hearings, are to get to the bottom of who said what when. I mean, his defence seems to be that, you know, if you worked in a stressful environment like Number 10 during lockdown, then the rules and regulations and guidelines didn't apply in the same way. I mean, did you get that memo? I don't... Uh, look, uh, uh, I think it's a question better put to him. Obviously, Boris is leading his own defence. Uh, he ample opportunity today to lay that out. I wouldn't really want to sort of paraphrase what his defence is. I think the most important thing is to wait for the committee to report, have a look at their report. So you're party chairman, you're the man in charge of making sure the Conservatives don't get annihilated at the next election. If you look at the polls, it's not a complete impossibility. Is Boris Johnson an asset to the Conservative Party? Well, I think Boris Johnson is a great campaigning asset to the Conservative Party. Uh, uh, only now I'm actually asking Boris if he would come out and campaign with us. For example, uh, one of my local issue campaigns in London is saving some of our bus routes. Boris is passionate about London buses. He brought in the Routemaster bus when he was uh, the, the refreshed Routemaster bus when he was mayor of London. I think he's a campaigning asset for the Conservative Party. You still think that he's a campaigning asset to the Conservative Party, even though you know people who went through an awful lot in lockdown, people who couldn't see their loved ones in care homes, people who couldn't comfort their loved ones at funerals. They'll be looking at a man who admits to misleading Parliament uh, over his own actions and those of those in Number 10, a man who was fined by police for breaking lockdown rules, and you still think he's an asset, well, a campaigning asset? Again, I wouldn't want to prejudge the Standards Committee investigation. I've told you things that we already know, that he's what fined by police and that he is mess up. Is that, uh, look, I, I, I work with Boris over a long time. He's been Mayor of London, I'm a London MP, uh, worked with him on the 2008 campaign, 2012 campaign, his time as Prime Minister. What I am clear about is that Boris Johnson is a campaigning asset for the Conservative Party. And that is why we should be using Boris as somebody who will be campaigning uh, in parts of the country for us at the next general election to return a Conservative government under Rishi Sunak. Is he a man of integrity? Look, I think Boris is, is a man who's a, a reasonably well known. Uh, what his strengths are, what his weaknesses are. His great strength, I think, in this case is his ability to campaign, his ability to galvanise voters as part of a broader Conservative family. I'm somebody who served under different Prime Ministers, under David Cameron, under Boris Johnson, under Rishi Sunak now, and I'm confident that Boris Johnson can be a campaigning asset for the Conservatives in the lead-up to next year's general election. But you're not saying that he's a man of integrity? Well, uh, look, uh, that's, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm in the business of politics, not moral judgment calls. And when it comes to politics, I know that Boris Johnson is somebody who can campaign well for us. And I'm looking forward to seeing him campaigning for us at the general election and for him to be re-elected as the MP for Uxbridge and South Ryslip. Well, let's get some analysis now, uh, shall we? We're joined, as usual, on the take from, uh, by our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates. It was interesting talking to Greg Hans there. He wanted to be loyal towards Boris Johnson. He was saying he was a great campaigning asset. He wants to get him out on the campaign trail. When I asked him the question about... This is Rishi Sunak's tax affairs, <laughs> yes. uh, by the way, so I'm not totally sure. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Absolutely smooth ship, as always. <laughs> um, but when I asked him the question, direct question, is Boris Johnson a man of integrity? He couldn't answer it, could he? No, and I think that a lot of Tory MPs have been looking at the three-and-a-half-hour circus today. Um, partly wondering what it's all going to end up being, but probably in large part thinking, my God, thank goodness he's not Prime Minister anymore. Because this process would have happened had Boris Johnson been in number 10 or not. And, and I think that underneath it, there are a couple of games going on. There is the uh, decision for the committee to make about whether or not they're going to recommend some kind of sanction against Boris Johnson if they determined that he uh, knowingly misled Parliament. And the committee were quite methodological in the way that they proceeded today. I mean, it was fairly clear they'd made up their mind, right? Uh, the way that they addressed uh, this man here uh, all the way through made it look as if they are likely to, to, to find he has been guilty of breaking some of the, uh, of the Commons rules. But there's a bigger thing Thing going on, which is people are sort of reassessing and, and engaging with what Boris Johnson returning to our lives is like. 
And what was really striking about the hearing is that time and again you were struck by when something goes wrong for Boris Johnson, he's the opposite of curious. He's the most, uh, the, the sort of most incurious person. He relies on the smallest of reassurances from one aide or another over some of the biggest problems that come down the track. He's not an individual, you get the sense, that goes looking for an issue that then he feels the need to solve. When he's asked about Partygate by the Daily Mirror, uh, it, the strategy is how to minimise the damage, not how to get to the bottom of what might have gone on. It, it, there is an element of Boris Johnson that's kind of hear no evil, see no evil, uh, and, and sort of defend, defend, defend. And the other really interesting thing, and I was actually driving in listening to the hearings in my car, so not normally, so slightly less engaged than I normally would be. And the thing that I, I just came on with is the impression that, you know, for the two years, the 18 months of the pandemic, I thought there was a man standing behind a podium every day telling us that the rules were incredibly strict. But today I listened to the same man sit in front of that committee and the rules had kind of holes in all over the place. Everything had an exception. Everything had a reason why you didn't have to follow the social distancing. It was very clear that the guidance didn't mean that you had to obey every piece of social distancing advice. There were exceptions everywhere. Yeah. I mean, crikey, you sort of came away thinking, what lockdown? Listening to his version of yeah. uh, what, what, what you had to follow. Yeah, I, I found myself doing a kind of re-examination as well because I, I will always remember what it was like to do this job during COVID, right? To interview government ministers and to try and be as on top of the rules as possible so that we could tell our viewers what was going on and interrogate our politicians. I remember Matt Hancock saying it was illegal to sunbathe in the park on your own. And I, I honestly, I, I kind of feel, again, going kind of through the looking glass on this, have I got this completely wrong the whole time about the rules and the guidance? Like, it makes you come and question it. Yeah, Boris Johnson was reeling off the fact that things would say, to the best of your ability when it comes to workplace social distancing. He was unpicking what uh, one metre plus meant uh, and what the exceptions were. He was um, uh, stressing, where necessary, the voluntary nature of what was going on. He was making clear uh, that celebrations of staff, although he wouldn't call it a party, was absolutely within the rules because that was part of motivating the people that you work alongside. I mean, these just were not conversations that you or I and almost all of the country had in 2020 and 2021. So it's mm. slightly odd hearing it like that today. Thanks very much, Sam. We'll have more from Sam uh, later uh, on the programme. Uh, you're watching The Take. We're live in Westminster as usual for you. Up next, we're going to be focusing on the vote over the Windsor framework, talking to one of the DUP MPs that voted against the deal. I was injured in Afghanistan and lost my both legs and uh, sustained some multiple injuries. You were very overwhelmed and depressed at the time, weren't you? Yes, yeah, at one point it was. I thought that my life was completely finished. It was actually um, a really hard work. Initially, I started um, uh, sports and ad adventure and start gaining my confidence slowly and slowly. And golf was one of them uh, and did other bits. Uh, and. Yeah, I think that I can climb the Mount Everest, so... So these are my working legs. So uh, these are the legs that I use. There's a heating system installed ah. to protect me from frostbite. Yeah. I can't afford to lose more limbs. No, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's one thing. Exactly. So I just use a different feet to climb. So these are too heavy. One is more than five kilograms. Right. Uh, so I use smaller legs to carry. These are for... Oh, you've got crampons. Yeah, yeah just for um, uh, you know ice and snow. Uh, these were not designed. You can't buy them commercially. And we actually designed these ones. Uh, they can go to uh, a crowd funder, Hari Bramagar, and uh, donate from there. So it's on a crowd So it's on your actual web page itself, isn't it? Or, uh, yes, yeah? a, they can visit haribramagar.com yeah. as well, and they can follow me on social media, Hari Bramagar. Whole expedition is for two months, yeah. uh, and hopefully, just from best camp all the way up and down, will take about seven, about seven, eight days. <laughs>
Hello, welcome live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Mm. Now, it's been a packed day. Of course, those hours of Boris Johnson facing questions from the Privileges Committee, plus votes in Parliament on the Windsor framework, and Rishi Sunak releasing his partial tax return, uh, shall I say. MPs are debating the Windsor framework, the amendment to the Brexit deal. Labour have confirmed they will be going with the government, but no Prime Minister wants to be in a position, obviously, where he's relying on opposition votes. So he's got a choice. He can be remembered for the great acts of statecraft that he achieved, or he can risk looking like a pound shop Nigel Farage. Eyes to the right, 515, the no select 29. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak published his long-awaited tax returns. They cover his time as both Chancellor and Prime Minister over the last four years. We take away really from it what a wealthy man the Prime Minister is. So in total shows that he earned nearly £5 million from a combination of his salary, his investments. And... The only criminal investigation he's ever been involved in is the one that found him guilty of breaking the law. <laughs> I said at the time I respected the decision the police reached and I offered an unreserved apology. Well, today, 29 MPs voted against the key parts of Rishi Sunak's new Brexit deal, including all of the Democratic Unionist Party's MPs. Well, we're joined now by the DUP MP Jim Shannon to talk about why your party decided ultimately you couldn't support what was on offer. OK, well, uh, thank you, first of all, Sophie, for inviting me. And, uh, Pleasure to be here to give our point of view and hopefully it'll be what your viewers uh, wish to hear. Um, simply, it didn't uh, mark up to our expectations, number one. We sought legal opinion on the matter. We, we had hoped to have uh, uh, the final legal opinion by the end of this week. Uh, we felt, felt that government perhaps had rushed it a wee bit in relation to bringing this forward. Uh, there's a choreograph out there following Sefcovic and James Cleverley's meeting on Friday. Uh, but legally, the opinions we got back were quite clear that it wasn't, it was a platitude of words, it certainly wasn't uh, uh, any way legally binding. Uh, and we felt uh, particularly uh, disappointed. Uh, by, by government's uh, um, uh, decision to go forward today. Do you think that you were misled then about the strength of it? The, that we talk about the storm of break. Uh, well, well I, I always try to be careful with my words. I think the the prime minister was uh, certainly over enthusiastic when we when he was in the Coca Cola factory. We wondered had he drunk all the Coke uh, because he was obviously bouncing from foot to foot. He was on a high. Uh, that right away put us on our guard because we figured ourselves. I mean, it can't be this good. Well, it certainly wasn't. It wasn't even good at all. Uh, so it's rather disappointing uh, that we find ourselves in this uh, uh, position where we have a, a very, very large divergence of opinion between the Conservative Party and ourselves in relation to it. Legally, the Stormont break is nothing more than a handbrake. It's not a stop. It's a handbrake. It's, it's a stop. But a handbrake is better than nothing, though, isn't it? And also, it's something that many people have said you wouldn't be able to do at all. Well, well I have to say, Sophie, if, if I thought that the handbrake would stay on... Uh, and then I would say to myself that that's, that we, we have something to work on. Uh, today, um, um, the uh, Secretary of State, Chris Eaton Harris, uh, gave us his, his opinion. His opinion was uh, that, uh, that 30 MLAs from two different parties, two different groups, can uh, can ask for any uh, a new EU legislation to be stopped. Now, <laughs> with that, when you look at that initially, you say, well, that's good. But then we found out it's it's conditional. First of all, it goes, I'm not quite sure what it means about this going to the community. Then it comes to Westminster. So what we need to have is a legally binding document written, written in, in, in the uh, laws of Westminster that we have in the screen behind us uh, in a way that we know then we, have, we can depend upon the 30 MLAs to actually do something. But here's the, here's the problem. The problem is it goes to Westminster, it goes to the government, whoever the minister is in charge and prime minister, uh, they, then they make a decision whether or not to, to support and, and back the 30 MLAs. The legal opinion that we get tells us that it's nothing more than words. So I'm sorry uh, to say that, that we're not convinced. Uh, and by the way, there's better legal minds than me. I'm just Jim Shannon. I'm not a legal mind, but, but people are, and they've advised us. The ERG had their legal opinion, separate opinion. Uh, the Orange Order back home and, uh, and some of the loyalist groups had their a legal opinion, a different legal opinion. But all those legal opinions came to the same conclusion. It's not legally binding. It doesn't work. What would you say to people who might be listening to you and thinking, look, the cat's out of the bag. The DUP are never going to back anything when it comes oh, to a Brexit deal uh, in the EU. You're always going to hold out, you're always going to find a problem and you're never going to accept a deal. Uh, 
Uh, I, I, I would say that we've been trying to find a problem. Uh, look. We, we, we're, we believe in devolution. We want to see devolution being successful. Uh, we would love to have a, 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 an agreement before us at, at Westminster that, that gives us a, an avenue and a way forward. Uh, from the very beginning, we have had discussions with uh, the Prime Minister, with James Cleverly, with the, uh, the Secretary of State uh, and other members of, of the, of the uh, uh, Conservative Party to try and find a constructive way forward. We have intimated to the Conservative Party that there are a number of outstanding issues which have not been addressed. Now, th th there are things, some of the Green Lane stuff is positive, but the negatives are that the, that the veterinary medicines hasn't sorted. The issue of, of, of cattle movements to, to Stirling and, and to, to, to Berwick are not sorted. The issue of, of fishing uh, um, issues, not one of them has been sorted. The constitutional position has not been sorted. Uh, the, EO, the, the European Court of Justice has not been sorted. So so we, we, we've asked for things to be done. Uh, the unfortunate thing is we've asked for weeks and, and they haven't seemed to have tried at all. The other thing that hasn't been sorted no. uh, is the government in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Stormont's still not up and running. What is the DUP's position? Are you now prepared to re-enter government? Uh, I, I think that, that today's vote has uh, uh, is, is clearly put our position uh, on record. Uh, um, we we uh, do not see at this time that we can uh, engage in, in, in the, an assembly once again. That we've asked. So the, what's no, going to no, happen? No, what, is it just going to? I mean, this is, this is a huge no, issue no. for people in Northern Ireland. They haven't got a functioning government. A cost of living crisis. When are you going to re-enter? Well, I mean, we, we, we fought an election uh, last year. We received a mandate, uh, and the mandate was clear uh, that the uh, um, uh, protocol issue had to be sorted. Uh, the Windsor framework was put forward in, in a, a, an overly energetic fashion by the Prime Minister, uh, making it to let us think that perhaps it had been sorted. The fact is, it's not. So, from, from our point of view, uh, we will continue to engage uh, with government. I think some of the Conservative MPs uh, today, even I think the Secretary of State, to be fair, uh, had intimated that the, the discussions will, will be ongoing. So our, our points of view are still to be heard. Now, our, and some people would say, look, this is just excuses. You don't want to get into no. government with Sinn Féin. You don't want to see a Sinn Féin First Minister. No, no I'm afraid it's, uh, that's not the issue, Sophie. Uh, as, as far as we're concerned as a party, we accept the democratic mandate. We accept that the, uh, Sinn Féin are the, are the largest party in the First Minister. We we, we, we can't. That's a democratic. I'm a democrat. I believe in that. I believe that wholeheartedly. So that's not the issue. The issue is you, and I say not you personally, but the government must sort the issues that we have put forward to them. They must give us some guarantee on the constitutional position of North. We've asked for that. I asked for that to. I'm not tell you who the MPs and who the ministers were today who asked me what do we need. I says we need something on the constitutional position of Northern Ireland. We're undermined, we're weak. Uh, I want to be as British as what you are, uh, therefore you, you have to do that. So I, I understand those requests to the ministers and prominent ministers as well uh, will be um, brought to the attention of the Prime Minister at their next uh, uh, meeting of, of the uh, uh, government. So we, we do live in the hope, uh, but until that time comes, um, okay. We, we, I don't believe we can we can move forward in a constructive fashion. I'm sorry to say. Now, while well, I've got you, um, ah, I just right. want to have a bit of a change of tone because we've been talking an awful lot about uh, Brexit. We're talking about COVID, we're talking about tax returns, and I just want to talk about this motion here, which I have to. You've you've tabled a parliamentary motion, right? And this is to recognise the 50th anniversary of Dolly Parton's "I Will Always Love You." There she is. And now I have to admit, I am. I, 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 I'm a fan. Uh, I love the fact that her book, kids' book scheme, which you can access in the UK, it's extraordinary if you haven't heard of it. It's every month, any child under five can get a free book thanks to this lady. It's extraordinary. Mm, yeah. Um, tonight in Parliament, my, uh, my Labour colleague and friend, Ruth Cadbury, uh, mentioned to me about that very book system. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I, I didn't know about it, by the way. Uh, but, but Dolly Parton, uh, uh, what a voice. Uh, what, what a character. Uh, she's an Ulster Scot, by the way, so I, I think I think her ancestry probably comes from the same direction. Um, but I think as a person, I just... Whatever song she sings, it's brilliant. Uh, and, and for me and for my wife uh, as well, uh, we, we, um, we love her. Uh, we, we love her music. Uh, and um, I, I think when she sings, wow, well, I just stop to listen, you know. Um, I, I think in the hustle and bustle of life as well, and I, I think, if, if you don't mind me saying, I think the early day 
motion today resonated with so many MPs. Check it tomorrow morning, you'll see many MPs have signed it. Uh, I've had so many lady MPs who have said, Jim, I just love that EDM. I, I've signed it right away, you know. So tomorrow morning there'll be lots and lots of MPs who will have signed it because they love Dolly Parton as well. Some of the, men, some of the men MPs <laughs> had their hands in there. They says, Jim, love Dolly Parton. I says, not as much as me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you very much for okay, being on the programme okay. uh, today. Yeah, uh, all uh, different topics covered uh, on the take. We're live from Westminster for you. We're going to be taking a closer look at Boris Johnson's appearance at the Privileges Committee and get the view from Labour next. Hello, welcome back. We are at The Take. You're live in Westminster. We have some breaking news to bring you now because we've heard from the Prime Minister in the last few minutes. This is what he had to say. Seeing the incredible life-saving work they do, and tomorrow I'll be highlighting the significant millions of pounds of UK government investment going into Wales to help create jobs and opportunity. Well, I've got to ask you a couple of questions, Prime Minister. First of all, you have published your tax return today. You're a very wealthy man. Last year alone, you accrued £1.6 million in capital gains. 
Do you understand what it's like to be someone striking for higher pay, to be someone struggling to pay their landlord or, or heat their home? Well, I published my tax returns because I said I would in the interest of transparency and I'm glad to have done that. Now, I think what, ultimately what people are interested in is what I'm going to do for them. And, you know, you talk about the cost of living, of course that's the number one priority that I've got, that I'm grappling with. That's why last year we took a decision to tax the windfall profits of energy companies. We're taxing them at 75% and we're using that money to help pay people's energy bills. So over the course of this winter and beyond, we're going to be paying about £1,500 of most people's energy bills. That's the type of support we're providing to help people and that should give people a sense that I am on their side. I'm doing everything I can to help them. Now, of course, another big issue today, you've passed the first bit of the Windsor framework through Parliament, but the European Research Group say that you had to rely on Labour Party votes in order to do so. Do you feel comfortable when your two former predecessors as Prime Minister have been voting against you today? Well, actually, I think what you said isn't true. There was incredibly strong support for the Windsor framework, not just from my own party, but across Parliament. It passed very solidly with Conservative votes, and that's because it is a good deal. It is a good deal for the people, for families, for businesses in Northern Ireland. The Windsor Framework restores the balance of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. It secures Northern Ireland's place in our union. It restores sovereignty. And for all those reasons, I'm pleased that it commanded such strong support. We're going to implement it now and make sure that we can look forward to a brighter and better future for Northern Ireland. Now, just finally, of course, today was also a big day in Parliament because your predecessor but one was answering questions before the Privileges Committee. One thing he said was that you didn't understand why you got a fixed penalty notice for attending a rule breaching event. Is that true? Well, I can't obviously comment on an ongoing parliamentary process. I'll let that play out. And with regard to myself, I addressed that at the time, apologised unreservedly for what happened. Rishi Sunak, thank, thank you. Rishi Sunak uh, there answering questions on everything from his tax return to that vote on the Windsor framework and, of course, uh, on the grilling of Boris Johnson, although he appeared a little bit less, uh, more reluctant, shall I say, uh, to talk about that in great depth. We can take a closer look now at the grilling that Boris Johnson did face from MPs because Joe Pike has been running his eye over proceedings. While this inquiry is clearly a make-or-break moment for Boris Johnson's political career, so no surprise the committee room was pretty packed, including with Boris Johnson's lawyers. You can see him uh, surrounded by a legal team. And when the going got tough, they seemed to uh, intervene a little bit. We could see notes being passed uh, from lawyer to lawyer and to the lawyer sitting next to Boris Johnson, as well as him taking some advice and conversations here with Lord Panic to the left here, uh, behind the former Prime Minister. Now, we are used to a jokey, pretty bullish uh, Boris Johnson, but that politician was nowhere to be seen today. He was on pretty serious form because this is a serious situation. Hand on heart that I did not lie to the House. When those statements were made, they were made in good faith. Now, the committee have loads, reams, pages of written evidence, but, of course, this was a live TV event, a visual event, so they relied pretty heavily on photographs, including this one, a leaving party in Downing Street. You can see at the front to the right uh, bottles of alcohol. One of the questioners, the SNP's Alan Dorrance, a former uh, detective constable, focused on that issue of why there was alcohol at this event. Would you say that that is strictly necessary for a work event? It's, it's customary to uh, say farewell to people in this country with a, a toast. Uh, I didn't see any sign of, of drunkenness or, or, or excess. Well, the former Prime Minister's defence seemed to be that the rules and guidance were, to an extent, up for interpretation, and he said the context of COVID, of the pandemic, was also significant. It really, though, got tense and testy when members of the committee asked uh, Mr Johnson about his claims to Parliament that he had received repeated reassurances that rules and guidance were adhered to. Some might see your reliance on the purported assurances you, you received as, and forgive me, as a deflection mechanism. I've tried to describe what I felt about these events as they were happening. Nobody raised with me yeah. uh, or, uh, or had any concern before I stood up on, 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 on uh, December the 1st. So who do you believe? The committee claim they have not made their minds up yet, but I'd suggest the tone of scepticism we heard from some 
uh, members of that committee suggest they're not entirely convinced by Boris Johnson's case, by his defence. We'll find out their judgment in the coming months. There's Ajo Pike uh, talking you through that explosive uh, committee session. Well, it's been a whirlwind day here in Westminster, so let's get Labour's take now because we are now joined by Jim McMahon, who is the party shadow environment, food and rural affairs uh, secretary. Thanks for being with us. Well, let's start with Boris Johnson, uh, shall we? What do you make of the evidence? I think anybody seeing the, uh, the performance, and it was a performance uh, in Parliament today, I think we'll be left feeling quite frustrated because, for me, this can't be viewed for how we feel today, how we live our lives today. We're free today, we can see our friends and family today, we can socialise today, if we have loved ones in care homes, we can see them today. That wasn't what was happening when Boris Johnson was breaking the rules and holding their part as in Downing Street. And I think his lack of empathy and understanding about what people really went through for those sacrifices, uh, I think, for me, is the biggest uh, mistake he's made in that representation. Was there a blurring of the lines, though, for people who were allowed within the rules to work together, who were working in stressful environments, who might have had a glass of wine or a beer at the end of the day's work? When we saw, of course, which I know a lot of people by social media are flagging up, Keir Starmer with a beer in Durham as well. And that's what the rules allowed for. The rules were... Because that's what he was saying, though, as well, Boris Johnson says... He, the guidance was followed? Uh, well, not particularly, because this was about what you could do uh, that avoided unnecessary contact. We were all asked to keep a two metres, or if not a metre, at least a metre. We were all asked to undergo changes to our daily routines. The difference here, and people do make the equivalence in the way that you've said, uh, first of all, that Keir Starmer didn't break the rules. He's pretty clear that he's a rule maker, not a rule breaker. Uh, and that was found uh, during the, the inquiry from Durham Police. But they were away staying away for work purposes. Boris Johnson and the staff who worked in Downing Street were there as their office and they were having parties, birthday parties. Kate was brought in. They literally went to Tesco with, supermarket, with, uh, with uh, suitcases, bringing in bottles of wine. That wasn't what was happening in care homes. It wasn't happening in hospital wards. And that's what we got to compare it to. And it was Boris Johnson, you know, uh, in the evening at the, the podium saying to people, listen, this is really important. We need to stay at home, we need to save lives and we need to protect the NHS. And people did that. They made the sacrifices. I know what my family went through in terms of making sacrifices, not seeing each other. What I've did heard your family go through then? Well, not being able to celebrate birthdays, not being able to meet on the anniversary of the, the passing away uh, of a grandparent. Um, the times when you would come together as a family to support each other uh, weren't there. And in a way, we were the lucky ones. We didn't have an elderly person in a care home. But if we did, imagine the wrench that you would feel today watching that performance in Parliament when potentially somebody that you loved, that you cared for, that raised you uh, in a care home, you weren't able to see in the final moments because you made the sacrifice because you were asked to for the national interest. And Boris Johnson didn't do that. I just think he's tone deaf to where the public are on this. Do you think that some people might be looking at this and thinking, look, it's time to move on now? And, you know, Boris Johnson has been fined by police. We've been all through all this before. People have made up their minds on this already. Why are we just going over the same ground? Well, I think integrity in politics really matters. Uh, I don't buy the argument at all that all politicians are the same, that we're all in it for ourselves, that poor behaviour uh, in the way that we're seeing and selfish behaviour is normal and should be accepted. I think the bar should be high and the public have a right to, for it to be high. I think the danger in what we see in Parliament is being kind of dragged into the gutter allows him to say, but everyone was doing it. Everyone was breaking the rules. You know, I know that everyone was at it. Everyone was not at it. I know people that work in the NHS. I know people that work in care homes. I know people that work for local councils. I know people right across the industry in retail and other places who stuck to the rules because they were asked to and they realised that there was a lot at stake here. Like, people were dying. The pandemic was ripping through society and people that we cared about were being lost. That was... The, the context. We can't view what's going on today through today's context where we're living our lives in a, in a freer way. In terms of should we just move on, uh, which is a, you know, a, a question that I've seen being asked, uh, I think that accountability matters and an inquiry by its nature is backward looking. That's what an inquiry does. And for a political accountability, it's important that the Prime Minister of the day, who asked so much of the nation, is held to account for the rules that he set. OK, well, look, we're here. We heard from Boris Johnson uh, today. We'll hear more, I'm sure. Uh, as that goes on. He says, of course, that he did follow uh, the rules and that he didn't willfully or intentionally mislead Parliament. I I'm keen to ask you about Rishi Sunak's tax affairs uh, as well, because he has published those uh, today. It shows what, I guess, we knew already, that he's a wealthy individual. Does that matter? 
it doesn't matter to his welfare. Uh, in fact, like, you know, fair play for somebody who's done well uh, and who earns that kind of money. It does mean he isn't experiencing the cost of living crisis in the way that many of us are. And I think a bit more understanding uh, from the Prime Minister and the Chancellor about the everyday struggles that people are facing, I think, would go a long way to rebuilding uh, trust and faith I mean, in democracy. I guess a lot of people think most MPs are relatively wealthy. If you look at, uh, the, I know they're different levels, but if you look at the rest of the country. Well, I mean, I left school at 15. I've worked in many of the jobs that my constituents work in, and I know what it's like to struggle and not be able to pay bills and make the choices about who in the family uh, eats. I know what it's like to struggle. Uh, and that, by the way, was in very different circumstances. We have family tax credits that helped us. Uh, I see people today that are really struggling to make ends meet and a government that isn't providing the support that's needed. You know, Labour's made calls for, for instance, the non-DOM tax status uh, to be changed. We've made calls for the 1% uh, pension uh, break that's currently uh, being put through that's costing a billion pound not to be prioritised in favour of support for working people. And the Prime Minister hasn't done that. So it's not about his personal wealth. We knew that he was well off. It was about, but does he understand the real-life lived experience of working people in Britain and I think the evidence says from the budget that he just doesn't. What about capital gains tax? You're talking there about tax policy, because what these tax affairs do also show is that the amounts of tax that you pay through capital gains tax is, of course, at a substantially lower rate to income tax. Is that fair? Well, I think we, we are going to have to have a review of, uh, of how tax uh, in the UK is balanced, whether it's right and fair and proportionate, uh, and whether it's equity for people regardless of their work status. Uh, Rachel Reeves, uh, of course, will be bringing forward those plans as we get close to the election. There'll be more to say on that. But what we said for this budget is that we can do far more on non-DOM tax status, we can do far more on the 1% who'll benefit from the pension break to help working people today. OK, thank you very much uh, indeed. It's great to have you uh, on the uh, you. show today. Thank you. That was Jim McMahon uh, giving uh, Labour's uh, take. Well, let's have a little bit of a uh, post-match uh, roundup, shall we, with our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Kate. Sam, we're just talking there about Rishi Sunak's tax affairs. Um, Craig Hand said that it was a complete coincidence that that was published today. Do we believe him? No, of course we don't <laughs> believe him. What a load of poppycock. Um, uh... No, they needed to get this out of the way. It was a great day to do it. It's um, slightly embarrassing just to be have a reminder that Rishi Sunak is as wealthy as he, he is. Now, he's married to the heiress of a billionaire, but what today's tax return shows here is that actually, in his own right, he's incredibly wealthy. The income in the last three years, uh, just from salary and uh, interest and dividends of some investments, comes uh, over a million, and then there's uh, another four million from the uh, increase in some investments in the US. Uh, so that makes him a very wealthy man uh, indeed. It, you've got uh, also quite a lot of money in an American savings account. Uh, that suggests, that amount of interest that he collects, suggests that he has about £80,000 in that bank account as well. So lots of money, a lot of it tied up in the US rather than the UK. Of course, he used to live there. Uh, but I think it's striking that the man who was Chancellor, now Prime Minister, uh, has his investments there. Uh, and, um, uh, and because, as you were asking Jim McMahon, uh, he has a lot of it tied up in investments that results in capital gains gains rather than income and you're taxed at the lower level. I just want to kind of like zoom out for a minute because it's been a completely <laughs> breathtaking day, should we say, in Westminster. We've had these three huge stories going off. Uh, we've had the tax return that we were just talking about there. We've had Boris Johnson's evidence. We've had the Brexit vote that on a normal day would be leaving the news agenda, the vote on the storm at break, on the Windsor framework, uh, if you like. It's a big day for this man, the Prime Minister. Mm. How do you think he has emerged after such a big day? Well, I think he probably will be quite happy tonight. Mm. Today's been about burying things, uh, burying the tax returns in the crudest uh, political sense. Uh, there's been a little bit of burying Boris Johnson. He may or may not survive this whole privileges committee, but three and a half hours questioning about his what he didn't do wrong when he was in number 10 is never a good look. And then the biggest thing for him is that his biggest gamble since becoming Prime Minister was to renegotiate the Brexit deal, the Northern Ireland bit of the Brexit deal, and he's got it through. And he's not just got it through, he's smashed it out of the park in many ways in terms of his own party. And I'll be honest, I remember talking, you know, before the vote, thinking, why is he doing this? Why is he having this war? This is only going to end one way, look at what happened to Theresa May, look what happened to other people before him. And yet, actually, I've, I guess I've been proved wrong. I'll admit it. I think Rishi Sunak is the first Prime Minister since John Major to challenge the kind of right, the Eurosceptic Brexiteer now, uh, right of his party and win. Everybody from David Cameron onwards lost, they tried it, 
and they lost. And ultimately, he's been the first one in, you know, 30 years to be able to do something that is no doubt contentious. There's no doubt that lots of people would say the Windsor framework, which adjusts how uh, Northern Ireland sits within Brexit, sits within the Union, sits within the European Union, uh, it, that has got its own problems still, but he's managed to pull off a political trick. And that's put an end, I really think, to the Brexit saga that's been going on since 2016. Today we closed a chapter of an enormous book in our history. It's massive, massive moment. It's not what we've been talking about, but Brexit is properly done today, and that's quite something. Yeah, it is. I mean, we're talking there about how Richard Sunak's emerged. What about Boris Johnson? So, I just think that, you know, watching him sit there and go... I just don't understand what the police were thinking when they issued all those fines. I don't know why those people who advised me would say all these things. I don't know why the rules were like that. I, I think there's just a sense that although he may be able to perform the role of Grease Piglick and wiggle out of this particular set of charges, I think it's a difficult day, a reminder of the difficult bits of Boris Johnson's legacy, as was the Brexit deal which sorted out the problems his Brexit deal created. I think it's been a day a bit of burying this man. Uh, well, there you go. Uh, thanks, as always, for your analysis. Uh, Sam Coates uh, there. That's it for The Take. We'll be back next week and every week on Wednesday at 9pm. Next up, Sky News at 10. <laughs>